Hey there, it's Jason Gorman from Codemanship with a bonus video on refactoring in Python. If you watched the, um, the demonstration I did of the refactoring discipline, I'll put a link in the description below if you've missed that, um, you will have seen me using automated refactorings that are built into PyCharm. Uh, I'm aware of the fact that a lot of Python developers don't use PyCharm. They use more stripped down editors like um, Vim um, and Emacs and VS Code and things like that. And um, you don't have those kinds of automated refactorings available to you necessarily. Uh, what I thought I'd do in this video then is take you on a tour of the refactoring menu in PyCharm. So if you're new to PyCharm, you can get a look at that. But also a, a lot of PyCharm users are not particularly familiar with the refactoring menu either. So if you are a PyCharm user, but you're relatively new to refactoring, then um, this is for you as well. Now, uh, the automated refactorings that are built in, um, their job essentially is to take out the donkey work of doing a complete refactoring and getting back to working code. And to demonstrate that first, we're going to do one of the simplest refactorings, which is renaming something. Now, renaming can apply to anything that has a name, like a, a class like Rover, for example, or a field like Facing, or a parameter like Y. And it needs to be done in two steps. You need to change the name of the thing that you're renaming, but you also need to update any references to it to now reference the new name. And that means that you're back at working code, hopefully. Now, that's relatively straightforward to do without automated refactoring tools. But, um, for example, with find and replace. But it is easier if you do have those kind of tools. Um, so I'm just going to demonstrate renaming a class. And I'll bring up the, the context-sensitive refactoring menu there. So we've got rename. Most of these refactorings have their own shortcuts as well, just to speed things up. So you can learn those and whiz along. Let's rename this Mars Rover. And we're going to refactor that. There you go. So we've changed the name of the class, but as you'll see, it's also updated in the tests. Any references to Rover have now been renamed to Mars Rover. So it's done as a single step. And let's just run the test and make sure that's all working fine. And it's also undoable in a single step. So I can undo that just like that. And we're back to Rover. Easy peasy. So they take out a lot of the donkey work, basically. And they also reduce the possibility of forgetting to do something or getting it wrong. So, um, and I think automated refactorings have one other um, benefit, which is that one step undo. So it's a little bit safer. And the other thing I like about them, I, I suppose, when I use them quite a lot, is that they kind of remind you, I've just done a refactoring, so I should run the tests. So they're nice self-contained, done as a single step. So that's rename. We can rename all sorts of things. That's fine. Easy peasy. Now let's do something a bit more sophisticated. This Mars Rover class, it's in the same file as the test. It doesn't really belong in this module. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this class into its own file. So this is a slightly more complicated refactoring to do. Let's call that file Rover and put it in the root folder. And again, it does it as a single step. And you'll see that it's replaced the implementation of the Rover class with an import for the Rover class. So our code still works. So it keeps all, all our references up to date. All of our imports are up to date as we move stuff around between files and between folders. So I find that very, very useful. Now, what else can we do? Well. Let's take a look at our Rover class. This Go method, which is the one that's being used in all of the tests. What if I wanted to change this method in some way, for example, to add a parameter? Well, we could use the change signature refactoring. Oops, wrong hotkeys. And we could add a parameter, let's call it user. So we need to know who is sending these instructions. And I can specify a default value, for example, Jason. And that default value will be used wherever this go method is called so that none of our calls are, are invalid. Let's do that refactoring. Run our tests. And if we take now a look 
at the, uh, the the test code, you'll see wherever we're calling the Go method, that username JSON is being passed in as well. We can also quite easily change the order of method. So if we wanted the, the user parameters to come first, very easy to do. Let's just take a look at our tests. So it's flipped them around in, in all of the calls to that Go method. So it takes out the donkey work. It's very, very useful. Now, what else might be we, we might be interested in doing? Well, many of the automated refactorings are about extracting existing code into things that have names for varieties of reasons. For example, we might say, oh, this R, what does that mean? Well, we could document that using a constant. So we're going to introduce a constant. Let's call it right. And you'll see that it's introduced that if we take a look at the top there. I'm not very happy about that name. What don't you like about that? Add a type hint. I don't think we need to add a type hint for that. Um, so we can introduce things that have names, which make our code more self-describing. <coughs> um, but it also helps us to break down our code when we take, uh, for example, repetition. If we see that um, that R being repeated multiple times, it's not in this case, um, but we could introduce a, a, a variable or a constant so it's only defined once in one place. Um, so we can extract constants, we can extract variables, for example, we wanted to introduce a variable for this list for some reason, then we can very easy do that. Instruction nice and easy. And it takes the code that we're we're extracting. It declares it as its own thing with its own name and then replaces it with a reference to that that declaration, in this case a reference to this variable. Parameters also we can introduce quite easily. So can't imagine why, but if we wanted that to be a for any particular reason we wanted that to be a parameter of this method. We could introduce a parameter like that and replace all of those. So we can call that north. And you'll see what it's done there. It's taken the value and made that the default value in the method declaration so that our code still works. And from our clients, we can pass in new values potentially if we want to. Don't know why you'd want to take that. That should be a constant really, but just for demonstration purposes. So constants, variables, parameters can be um, introduced from existing code to essentially give things names but also to remove duplication and um, for more complex code for executable code for example all of this code here if we wanted to break this long execute method down we could extract a method so put it in its own method and this will work for any sort of piece of executable code so a block of code or a statement or an expression Let's call that method right for turning right. And you will see because, because that north parameter was declared before this block of code, it has to become a parameter of this method. It has to be passed in. If this method was declaring something or changing something that was being referenced further down, outside of this method we're extracting, that would necessarily then have to become a return value. Okay, so let's extract that method. And we can run our tests. So all sorts of reasons that might we want we might want to introduce um, from existing code, introduce constants and fields and parameters, and to extract code into its own methods, to break methods down, to make code more readable and so on and so forth, or self-documenting. All sorts of reasons we might want to do that. Um, but we also might want to do the reverse. So let's say that we don't want this in its own method for whatever reason. And um, what we can do is we can we can inline that. So inlining basically takes the implementation of something and replaces references to it with that implementation. 
so it puts it back in its place as it were and i use inlining quite a lot for all sorts of things um, in particular i use inlining when i've got a bunch of methods or classes that i um i want to redistribute the code i want to change the way the the, the responsibilities are distributed between the methods and classes and I might start that process by inlining them all into one big lump and then redistributing them by extracting methods and so on and so forth. Um, in this case, I've no real reason for doing this, but just for demonstration purposes. Now, here's the great thing about automated refactorings. They're quite smart, usually. They will have a precondition, so conditions under which this refactoring will work. And if that precondition is broken, if the structure of the code is such that, that the tool can't do this without breaking the software, it will usually warn you. So if I try to inline this, at this point it'll say, I can't do that, that's going to interrupt the control for us. So it can't do it without breaking the software. So nice little warning there. Sometimes the, these are false positives or false negatives. Um, and we can fix that. Let's just change this code so that we can make it work. So we'll use else's. Let's format it correctly, hopefully. And get rid of that. Now, I think the tool will be able to handle this so let's try inlining this method now. And it'll give us a number of options here. I could inline it so where that method is being called, it will be replaced with the implementation of the method and it will delete the original method. Or I can say, no, I want you to replace any invocations with this implementation, but I want you to keep this method as well. In this case, I want to delete the method. And when I do that, that method will disappear, and as we scroll back up, you will see that its implementation is in place of where we were calling that method. And that can work for, in various circumstances, for um, fields and for variables as well. We can inline things. If we think we don't actually need a named method for this, we don't need a named variable for this. And rerun my tests. So that's what a lot of the, the refactorings are about, about extracting stuff, essentially about extracting chunks of code, literal values, expressions, statements, blocks of code into their own named things. Um, there's a couple more that we're going to look at um, while we've got time. Um, so at the class level, I can extract a superclass for this. Let's call it vehicle. So we're going to create an abstraction for vehicles that can accept sequences of instructions. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take the go method and I'm going to, well, let me, oh, it should let me. That's interesting. Oh, you have to tick that first. Silly Jason. Okay, make it abstract. So it's not going to have an implementation in this base class. So essentially it will be an abstract class. Let's perform that refactoring. Off it goes. And you will see that we have this vehicle abstraction now. And it's essentially an abstract class with an abstract method called go. So we can't create instances of this. Let's just rerun our tests. OK. <coughs> so very easy to do that. Um, and when we have this kind of class hierarchy, if that's what if that's your style, we can do some some reasonably smart things. We can pull up and push down members in our class, for example. So if we want to take something from the subclass and pull it up into the base class for whatever reason. Um, so it's saying so again, it's smart. It's saying well, you can't if you just take go, go uses execute, which means you have to take. A whole bunch of stuff with you don't you for it to work let's uh, let's see what happens when I do this I think this is possibly going to break it let's find out okay so again it's smart it's telling me oh well um, it's already got a go method so that's not going to work um, 
let's just quickly it would be pretty easy to do this I'm just going to delete this go method just so I can demonstrate how these work so now let's do it again let's try and pull up the go method into the base class and it's saying well um, it needs to take execute with it let's make it abstract let's see what happens no actually no let's not let's take the execute method with it let's do that refactoring okay and you'll see um, that our implementation has been moved up into the base class uh, the, the base class there let's just run our test to make sure that has worked and we can just as easily push those members down again so go and execute off it goes back where we started so we can introduce abstractions and we can push and pull members between abstractions we can make them abstract or have them be concrete so it helps working with those kind of hierarchies a little easier now I don't use those particularly often more often than not when I'm using abstract classes in Python I'm using them to represent interfaces and um, so all of the methods will be abstract um, and I do that mostly to sort of document that there's a contract here that if if you're doing dependency injection you're passing objects in they must implement this interface in other words they must inherit from this abstract class and they must implement all of the abstract methods so i use it for that relatively frequently in fact just as a kind of a documenting thing to document that there is an abstraction there that you need to be mindful of although the language doesn't of course absolutely require it so um, those are most of the refactorings. Those are the refactorings I use most often in PyCharm. They take out a lot of the donkey work, so I find that refactoring is a lot easier and a lot quicker and a lot safer when I'm using them. They are not compulsory. You are very welcome to refactor by hand using whatever tools you like to use, including PyCharm. But I do find that when I'm refactoring by hand, it's more work and I be, need to be super, super disciplined um, to make that work. But you know, if that's the way you want to go, that's absolutely fine. There's no right or wrong on this. But I thought you would find it useful to take a look at these. Um, and if you've got PyCharm, um, have a play. And if you're interested in PyCharm, um, by the way, I'm just absolutely clear. I'm not sponsored by JetBrains. I just happen to use the tool and find it very useful. Um, but if you're interested in, in exploring that, then I think there's like a 30-day trial that you can download. And you can have a play at refactoring your code using PyCharm. So there you go, that's the refactoring menu in PyCharm.